what is it you do really well? Focus on that. It'll help you feel better about yourself. It'll help you continue to uh, you know, get stronger in that skill set. And don't worry about the things that you're not as good at. So I do that with patients. And we do that with team members now. Find their strength and promote it. Find a place for it and let them continue to get better and better about it. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative and Google Chrome Enterprise is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership with one of the contributors to my latest book, the number one best-selling CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, as well as from other top CISOs and cybersecurity thought leaders. Listen to previous CISO Stories episodes at securityweekly.com slash CSP. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com. I am your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Mark Eggleston, CISO at Computer Services Company. I had always been interested in computers, you know, helping to found the, the computer club in high school, but never really took it anything other than like a gaming kind of, this is kind of casual fun. Um, but what took me into cyber was the opportunity to be a HIPAA analyst back in uh, the early 2000, 2001, actually. And, you know, uh, was recruited to help build a privacy and security program for a national hospital provider. And given my prior uh, hospital and mental health experience, it was just something really interesting. I couldn't pass up. I could get to understand the privacy regulations and controls and then the security regulation and controls and help build a program around it. So the rest is history. So you, you have an interesting career path. And today we're talking about security musings from a psychotherapeutic perspective. And, <laughs> and I don't think we've had anybody uh on the program yet that is that is started out as a uh psychotherapist mm -hmm. and uh and then moved into cybersecurity. So tell us about that that transition. Yeah, well this is a uh, career number three actually. And I would say this one's a keeper. I mean the other ones were great too, but you know, starting off um with the undergrad in psychology in the early 90s, uh, I did what most people did. Uh, I, I continued to wear my tool belt and frame houses and things like that just because it was a recession year. And I had, um, you know, just really enjoyed building things. I guess I've always had that um, experience. And, you know, after a while, it's like, you know what, this probably isn't what I went to college for. This probably isn't something I see in my long term. You know, there were days in uh, Richmond, Virginia, where I grew up where the August humidity really would get to you as well. It's like, I don't know if I see myself in the long haul doing this. So, went so, back to so you went to college, you went to college. Uh, it, so were you a carpenter after you you got your degree in, in psychology or or before then? Um, I would say during and after. So when I would come back from undergrad, I would, you know, have college, uh, excuse me, I would have, uh, you know, Christmas breaks, summer breaks. And it was just, you know, it was great to learn a trade and get paid pretty well. So that was probably what drew me in the carpentry is just the availability of the job. And then go after uh, graduating, I continued to work for a year and then did a little cross country venture stint. And then after that, it was time to go back and get serious. And most of the time when you choose psychology as an undergrad, it's the understanding is you will need to go and pursue a graduate degree. And that's exactly what it did. Just took a year off in between, probably a few years off, actually. Went back to then found my passion working in a mental health uh, hospital that specialized in treating children and adolescents with medical issues that were compounded with a behavioral issues. So stereotypical would be someone, a kid with diabetes that was just angry at the world and did not want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, apply the, the treatment regimen the doctors had ordered to them. And they would end up in ketoacidosis and, and, you know, really serious condition for those folks. And, you know, traumatic brain injury, lots of other uh, uh, scenarios. But that was, you know, wonderful experience. Intrinsically, I mean, it was great. But what 
um, didn't do is, is help me raise a family. So when it came time to, you know, make sure that my wife could stay home, we could take care of our children that way. I needed something that was going to be a little bit more lucrative and open me up to a little bit more options. And so that got me more into the, um, uh, the HIPAA analyst work and things of that nature. Could still use some of my experience with hospital settings and uh, better understanding of computers and systems. And it was just wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Got to work with a crackpot uh, team of uh, former um Folks that worked at like big consultancy companies, so they knew the value of presenting in succinct ways and making sure that you really have processes that are you know highly adoptable and highly available to the hospital staff. Nothing too complex, something that made sense and resonated with them and was presented in a really engaging manner. So we would have uh, national conferences that we would schedule and come up with the content, and then you know serve as a consultant to you know. Uh, other hospital folks in 19 different states come up with this program and it worked really, really well. But then he was able to apply that whole approach to a, a regional HMO where I've been, gosh, I was almost there for, for 20 years in a regional HMO before moving over to the current gig I have now, the CISO of a corporation service company headquartered in Wilmington, Delaware for the last two years. So all the experiences I've had, Todd, have just been wonderful. Um, Really haven't had a, a bad boss and really have had wonderful teams that have continued to grow in size and grow in maturity. And um, it's just a wonderful field. All three, carpentry, mental health, and CISA. All, all three, wonderful for all different reasons. Well, well it sounds like you, you've you know, found, found, found that uh, right path in there. So, so what sort of things can we learn from psychotherapy that, that applies to um that applies to the, mm -hmm. the CISO role well I, I think what you're seeing more in the CISO role is it's less of a technical role and more of an executive role more about leading people more about getting folks um to you know share your vision of a path forward and I think when you're talking about that executive skill set it's really important you have to understand what drives people right what's going to help them uh, it, what motivates them and psychotherapy really helps you get to a lot of that too. You might have different tactics for, um, you know, rallying a group versus an individual and getting to know somebody and see what their motivators are, see what's going to help them get to the next level. And, you know, I think just taking that personal interest in your staff and, you know, sharing your story is really, really helpful too. They also have a thing um, in psychotherapy about therapeutic use of self. So it's not really about you, but you're resonating what you're hearing from the client and then sharing that back with them in order to help them continue a path of self-actualization, so to speak. And I think that skill set that you do in psychotherapy is really helpful for one-on-ones or when you're talking to executive audiences. I think also working with consultants really helps you get to the point and a lot of CISOs aren't really known for exceptional storytelling skill sets. They aren't you know, always known as, as folks that can get right to the point in a non-technical manner. And I think understanding your, the other person across the table from you and what resonates in their language and their body language is really, really important. And you, and you really get that when you're doing psychotherapy, whether it be in an individual, a family or a group basis, you really have to get quite adept at those skill sets. So that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm kind of a, a, a junkie on the Myers Briggs stuff, the Enneagrams, the disc profiles, the leadership yes. books. In fact, half of this bookshelf uh, you see behind me are security books. The other half are leadership, mm -hmm. personality yep. books. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on things like the the MBTI and and disc and enneagram and, and those sort of tools yeah i've used both of them i mean disc has become gosh this will be the third place that i've worked at that has a disc you know uh, questionnaire and, and and interpretation available to folks i've used that in our inner team sessions to see what team members what motivates them and what their style is both for coming to a decision and analyzing things so i think it's always really really helpful Myers-Briggs, I think, is helpful, too, but they're just coming into, you know, I guess, like, not prototypes, but a, a typing of, of, 
of what your traits are and trying to put you in a certain area. And, and I've never really felt like I'm necessarily an introvert or an extrovert. I love, for example, I love to have my solo time to be creative. And, you know, me with a fishing pole, maybe a cold beverage on a beach is like one of my favorite spots to be. But I also love going to conferences and engaging with other people. I have to force and push myself to get into that mode. But once I'm doing that, I really get a, a wonderful energy up learning from my peers and seeing what the challenges they have. So I think, Todd, you know, those different books on leadership, I'd say 70, 80 percent of what they are is based upon psychology, too. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that matter, you know, psychotherapists have something called strength based perspective. And that is, what is it you do really well? Focus on that. It'll help you feel better about yourself. It'll help you continue to, uh, you know, get stronger in that skill set. And don't worry about the things that you're not as good at. So I do that with patients. And we do that with team members now. Find their strength and promote it, find a place for it, and let them continue to get better and better about it. I, you know, it's great to hear you say that and be, because I, I think it took me many, many years to figure that out that, that, you know, cause I, I tried to be good at all these things <laughs> and it's like, right. well, why is it some things, some people are just better at than I am, but I, I'm good at some of the things that, that I do. And I, and I, but I've, I've, I think I've taken time to, you know, figure out what those are and, uh, you know, writing the CISO Compass book, I included a, a full chapter in that book called uh, Workforce Multi-Generational uh, Dynamics, mm -hmm. uh, Team Dynamics. Uh, and it's based on the Myers-Briggs, the DISC profile, the differences between the generations and how we look at the world. Because, And you don't see that in many security books that are yeah. focused on the soft side of things. And it's, it's so important that, so I love to hear it from, from you who has the, the training in psychology. We're, we're like uh, many or, or psychologist wannabes, I think that it's yeah. like the Myers-Briggs stuff. Um, yeah. And it's, it's good to, good to hear that, that perspective. Yeah. I think, you know, 20 years ago, Todd, when people were just still learning about cyber, but getting cognizant of just how impactful a hack could be in the cost, they were eager to get anyone help explain and make sense of that. So a technical CISO was very much the dominant trend. But fast forward a decade or two, and it's like, oh, wow, we're continuing to spend a lot of money, but our results aren't necessarily better. So maybe it's not the technical uh, piece that's always needed. And, and for the record, I think both skill sets are very much needed. You need to have some technology expertise, but you also need to have the executive presence and also need to have better understanding of leadership principles and how to grow a team and all those uh, other things, budgeting, so much more than just a technical piece. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers. So what do you think about people today that are trying to break into cyber? Um, I, what's, what's the best path for that? There is so many different things that are written about this on LinkedIn, right? People that are trying to give a, a leg up to those uh, up and comers, newcomers. Um, and, you know, obviously myself being in a different career besides cybersecurity for a couple of times before I landed where I'm at, um, I think you can always leverage what you've done before. You know, working in carpentry taught me resilience. Working in that building, reading the blueprint taught me the importance of good engineering. Um, you know, when you're out there on a roof and, and needing support, you know, it, uh, the, the ladder jacks that you're using to get up on a roof and do some shingling or do some signing, you learn to trust your team members and how important collaboration is and spotters to check you and things of that nature. So all those things kind of help me. Um, so I, I think anyone can make that transition, but have some patience. You know, a lot of people are going into this because of it's a lucrative career. Uh, and that and that is true. But also keep in mind, you should have a plan like, you know, be prepared to cut your teeth for a couple of years. Be prepared to, you know, uh, expose yourself to lots of different things. I saw a post not too long ago saying GRC is a wonderful way to get into cyber. And I would agree. A lot of people are more like, oh, I want to be in the SOC. That's what 
cybersecurity means to me. And that's not a wrong answer, but I would encourage folks to uh, broaden their horizons and pick a domain that resonates with them. And for me, GRC, having uh, control mapping, better understanding what security is and the vertical that you're in. And for me, previously, that was HIPAA and healthcare, makes a whole lot of sense and helped me make sense of security early on. Um, you know, I'm also asked, Todd, you know, do you get certifications? Is it important to go back to school and get a degree? Is experience? I mean, I would say pick any two and you'll do well. Pick all three and you'll knock it out of the park and make that part of your career planning and know that that's not going to be a couple of years, right? It's going to take a few years to several years to get all three of those things established if you don't have any of those three. Um, but if you put together a good plan and a course, as others have said, get a really good mentor that can help guide you along those things and can give you honest feedback and that you'll take that honest feedback. I think that means a whole lot. Um, there's so many different ways in cybersecurity from a SOC and technical and you know coding perspective to cybersecurity sales, to cybersecurity leadership, uh, education and training. You know, I'm seeing more and more roles as more and more uh, CISOs develop dedicated teams in education and training and the creativity that's required to get salient digestible chunks that's going to help you know raise the security IQ of your workforce. That's really, you know, as much as a art as it is a science. So dedicating some people in that area, just turning uh, folks on to all the different options. You know, third party risk is another one where people have built out a lot of tools and a lot of teams. Uh, th there's no end to it. There's no part of cybersecurity or no part of a business's operations that you don't get to roll up your sleeves in when you're doing cyber. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think there's so many opportunities in this field. And uh, I was just talking with somebody the other day about, you know, we seem to have this image problem that everybody thinks that this is the, the guy in a hoodie over a dark yeah. screen uh, looking at things. And, and there's so many different roles that you could probably take every profession out there and map it into a job. Uh, within cybersecurity, <laughs> and, and right. I don't think I don't think we market that very, very yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Well, what is it? I think the uh, the feds have a nice framework that helps you actually see what kind of skills you need for certain positions. So there's there's some beginnings uh, of mapping that out there. I also think back to your point about the the no hood or no hoodie hackers, you know, movement about stop, you know, portraying the media portrays us as folks and the hackers. I think sometimes if you draw attention to it, you just exacerbate the problem. Don't make it any better. I think it's more educating that, you know, having a hacker mindset is actually a good thing. I think that's another hallmark of a good security practitioner is to be insatiably curious, right? Like remember, you know, when you raised your kids, Todd, and there were three, the common question was, but why? But why? That's the staff you want. You want them to ask why. Then they start to think, well, how could I reverse engineer this? If I did it this way, what else could I find out? That's a really good way to approach problems in cybersecurity. What, how else can you repurpose it or re, you know, reverse engineer it? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Well, you know, while I've got you here, I, I have to ask the question about mental health because uh, we, we've done a, a couple of podcasts around, uh, you know, talking about the mental health issue, but uh, it, it, is, is that real in cybersecurity or is that, do you think that's overblown? No, I, I think it's real and folks openly talking about it is giving it more light and encouraging other folks that may have been silent in the past to say, yeah, you know what, this is real. And then, you know, add to that post-pandemic uh, stressors such as all the work from home that we're doing in isolation and always on with, you know, uh, virtual meetings and things of that nature. Yeah, there, there's something brewing there, right? Um, you know, th there's articles out there that talks about the, the the tenure of the CISO being 18 to 24 months. I've seen it be shorter than that. I've seen it to be a teeny bit longer, but it pales in comparison to other executives such as CFOs and, and other uh, corporate executives. And I think it's about the always on attitude. I think it's about our willingness to jump into the fire, not run away from it. Um, so much dynamics of this. I mean, it's almost like a first responder type um, uh, approach. And then add to that uh, the lack of, of people coming into it or the lack of, of uh, readily skilled people, highly skilled people. Now you have to train them, right? It's kind of like 
your retirement savings. You can't just say, I want to retire and, and have a couple million in the bank. You have to feed into that and grow that out through a diverse strategy. And we need to do the same thing when we're looking at cybersecurity folks. But, but back to the mental health piece, um, I do. I, I think we have to look at things just like a lot of IT professionals are now saying about resiliency. You have to, you know, basically say, you know what, I'm going to get breached, chances are. So my my response should not be how to necessarily always stop it. Those are, those are good to have, don't get me wrong, it's good to have the, the blocking and tackling controls in place, but what happens if somebody does get past that or when they get past that, I guess is a better way to ask that. What will you do to improve and increase your response time and hopefully lessen the financial and operational impact to your company? And I think you can borrow a lot of that from the psychotherapeutic principles and, you know, looking at things from a much more resilient perspective and, you know, not beating yourself up over things that may have, um, uh, you know, been in negatively impacting your career and, and, and things of the past. So, you know, don't, don't get stuck in, in, in loops and uh, beating yourself up. Um, assume that you're going to have some issues and how you're going to relieve things. And the other piece too, Todd, is, is people are talking about making sure you take the time. We encourage our staff all the time, take your PTO. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have some hobbies outside of staring at screens. Make sure you're doing some things to physically keep you active. Studies show, you know, exercise does a lot for your mental health and your well-being, and not to mention your physical health. So lots of different options there. Mm -hmm. It, it's funny you say that. I've always been a big proponent of, of when you're on vacation, you should be away because uh, recreation means to recreate, and and you can't do that if you're if you're answering your phone, if yep. you're if you're always on. You you have to you have to disconnect. I, I think you, you come back with such a you know such a better such a better attitude, and I. I was teaching, uh, we had these uh, sessions called culture shaping. They were one day uh, mm -hmm. seminars for a large health insurance company. And one of the uh, things I remember from that, that I just loved is it was from the Sendelaney teaching of uh, be here now. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it was talking about mm -hmm. being mentally uh, where you are physically. And, and so if you're, if you're, if you're at home, you, you should your attention should be when you walk in that door it should be on your spouse your your partner your your family um and and when you're at work it should be at work and there's always going to be exceptions but but you know disconnect put the put the phone down when you're when your teenager yeah. wants uh they say they want eight minutes of your time that's all they want and then they want to go be with their friends give them that undivided eight minutes yeah. and i and i think we have to we owe it to ourselves to to give that to give that time to mm -hmm. and to disconnect and i think as leaders we have to support our our teams so that we they do. feel that they can do that without feeling guilty that they're doing mm -hmm. that. they should and it's challenging too especially for the folks that are really pushing for the next promotion right they feel like yeah, I hear you, but that's really hard in our culture. But you're right. We have you have a if your leaders give you a supportive team and counter each other, support each other, encourage to take the time off and disconnect, you can make it happen. I think the other thing too is the power of delegation. Like my teams know how to get me, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna be pulling communications down when I'm on vacation. That doesn't mean email, that doesn't mean teams. It means if you need me, call this number. Chances are I'll pick it up or we'll figure out a way to do that. But most teams don't ever call that number because they know because you've already taught about the delegation and the other support structures. But at the same time, yeah, that's part of the role. I'll be there to support folks if they need it, but it's rare that they do if you if you, you know, empowered your team the right way for sure. Yeah. To your point about the the um the pr point of being present. In those discussions, that's really tough. Like I can remember the days when BlackBerry first came out or CrackBerry as they called them. It's really challenging to put those things down. And studies continue to show like, hey, if you take that diversion and attention, that 30 seconds you took, it's going to take you a good five to 10 minutes to get back on track and refocus. So it's a, it's a heavy cost when you pick up and look at that additional screen. I think another thing that's helped me, you know, when you, you resonated with me, Todd, when you mentioned your kids. Because we all have several hats to wear. I'm a CISO, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a son. 
And there's lots of dependents that rely on me for those four hats. So I, ha- I always try to be mindful and cognizant. Okay, what hat am I giving 95% of my attention to right now? And then focus to that. Allow yourself just to focus on that and understand that some days, one of, some of those other roles, I'm going to really suck at. But I'll work to make it up later. Mm-hmm. And some of the other hats will not be as strong. So I, I, I think it's we can't expect ourselves to be hitting 100% in all those roles all the time. Yeah, and I remember reading once that uh, that we get work life balance wrong. It doesn't mean that it's it's fifty fifty all the time. It means that sometimes right. you're going to be a little bit out of whack, but then you need to make a plan to be out of whack the other way. Uh, you know, at certain times, and you know, not go from one huge project to another huge project to to give right. yourself that buffer time. Uh, in between times. Okay. Well, th- well, this has been great, Mark. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think we could talk for quite a while about this because I think it is, it is so important. There's the job and then there's, you know, there's all this other stuff around the job in our, in our lives and, and, and maintaining our, our healthiness. So what, what further advice would you give to emerging CISOs, current CISOs, experienced CISOs, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as they're as they're navigating their career and, and trying to keep everything in check. I would make sure that they're pursuing things to keep everything in check. So your question was targeted not towards the entry level, but the experienced security practitioners. Um, you know, I mentioned some of the things that I've done before, so I'll give her a plug now. But Amy Moran's 13 strings, 13 things mentally strong people do has really res- resonated with me. And, you know, encourage folks to Google and look at that, pick one or two, read the short synopsis, read a book, and it can really help you, you know, focus on the things that matter, not beat yourself up repetitively on the mistakes of the past. Um, That's really, really helpful. Uh, I don't think I need to tell most security practitioners because it can back to my point on them being very curious by nature, but always keep learning, always making sure that you're carving out time for your own professional development. You know, the recent story from Wall Street Journal about how there's uh, a a gap between CISO's um, skill in the boardroom and then boardroom positions that are being pushed by the SEC ruling is coming out. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're dedicating some time to learn some new accreditations and new learnings there. So you're prepared for those roles when they do come up Uh, and they will come up for you. You're continuing to follow this path if that's of interest to you, but never give up on learning. Um, always push some of the more leadership things, pursue some of the softer side of communication. All those things are, are really good uh, things to do in my book and how to succeed in this role. I, I, I think that's, that's great advice. Thank, thanks a lot, Mark, for taking the time today. Thank you, Todd. It's a pleasure uh, chatting with you. Thank you. Are you constantly thinking about how to keep your enterprise as secure as possible? Get to know Chrome Enterprise, the browser that will secure your organization without the added expense and complexity of additional browsers. Its simplified management features will free up your team to focus on critical security tasks that can be overlooked because of time and attention it takes to manage other solutions. Don't settle for a browser that compromises your organization. Visit securityweekly.com chrome now to start protecting your organization like never before.